Okay, we're almost there. No, just grab the one to your left. No, 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 your other left. Oh, come on, Doug. Just, here, just give me. Oh, oh hey, everybody. Rolling my card castle here with the Sticky Paddle Gaming Network. Woo! A lot's been going on since the last season of Creepy Gaming. My roommate, Doug Ratman, unfortunately, is finally moving out. It's okay, though. I understand. He found a better place for a better price. Plus, that attic can't be too comfortable. Anyways, where's my manners? Let's do this the right way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and nerds alike, welcome. Well, come on. I'm Malt Mike with the Gaming Network in full screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming 7. Can you believe that? Seventh season? I didn't even know I could count that high. You like the new set? Huh? Okay, it's really, it's the old set. But hey, look, we got so much more room now. We got all kinds of room for activities. We can do so many activities. It's awesome. We can do karate. <laughs> Been teasing it for a while now, but I thought it was only fitting that since this is season seven after all, we will be talking about for our season opener, none other than Resident Evil one through six. See what I did there? Because seven and everything, oh, never mind. All kidding aside, it's a double feature, folks. Hey, don't worry about it. I told you I was gonna do it. I am gonna cover Resident Evil seven. But in this video today, I'm covering Resident Evil 1 through 6. If you want to see what I think of Resident Evil 7, it should be up right now for a Season 7 double feature. Thanks to everyone who recommended these episodes. They are well earned. As a matter of fact, thank you all. Thank you all for making 7 seasons of creepy gaming possible. It blows my mind. As a matter of fact, we are even going to be hitting our 100th episode of Creepy Gaming this season. Wish me luck. I'm gonna need it. So, without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. words chilled me to the bone as a kid. I often get asked, what games have scared you, the ever handsome mullet Mike? The first two Resident Evil games definitely belong there, and seven isn't too far off, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, while some of the first games admittingly didn't age well in their original forms, they hold an important place in video game history. And if you don't believe me about them not aging well, then go back and play the original Resident Evil and check out that wonderful voice acting. Hey! Come here! Joseph! All kidding aside, Resident Evil, also known as Biohazard in Japan, holds a special place in creepy gaming history because it is technically the first survival horror game. Now, I can literally smell my comment section down below catching a blaze after such a statement, but allow me to explain before you work your way into an early carpal tunnel diagnosis. Yes, there were other horror games like Clock Tower and Alone in the Dark, but Resident Evil was the first game to coin the phrase and be categorized as survival horror rather than just horror. The games share many ongoing themes, one of which is survival, like I said. And by that, I don't just mean staying alive. The term is in reference to the fact the Resident Evil games don't give you a lot of ammo or health, forcing you to ration, making you survive. Over the course of 20 years, the series has had several theories, easter eggs, and memorable creepy moments. 
Other themes in the franchise include limited save points, eerie atmospheres, puzzles, an ever-growing narrative, and... <sighs> Zombies. Yep. Zombies. <sighs> okay, so most of y'all know I can't stand zombies. They're just so overused. But, to be fair to this game, Resident Evil was one of the first video games to bring zombies back into the pop culture since George Romero's Living Dead films. So, we have to give credit where credit's due. That being said, let's take a look at the first game. Resident Evil Released in 1997 by Capcom and directed by Shinji Mikami, Resident Evil puts you in the role of two playable characters, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine. The premise of the game is relatively simple. Your characters are members of STARS, a rescue team. In the game's opening cinematic, you are chased down by mutated hellhounds into the mansion where the game takes place. Through playing, we find out that the Umbrella Corporation is behind what is known as the T-Virus, thus unleashing mutated zombies and monsters galore. As forementioned, the entire game takes place on the mansion grounds. But the setting is what helped make this game so creepy. The Spencer Mansion was filled with puzzles, and whatever you do, don't ever try exiting through the front door. Hey guys, why don't we just use this door? It's unlocked. Never mind. Here's a creepy fun fact in our first eerie theory. That there are not one, but two predecessors to the original Resident Evil. Capcom's Sweet Home and the aforementioned Alone in the Dark. Also directed by Shinji Mikami. Many people even call Sweet Home the original Resident Evil. Definitely check them out if you haven't by now. Whether they take place in the same universe or not has been theorized and debated for years. But one cannot deny the mansion layout being an integral part of Resident Evil. A lot can be said for the original, both good and bad. I will say this, even though it might not have aged well, it was a forefather in gaming. Just being a kid when these games came out, they terrified me. The creepy old mansion, the dark gothic atmosphere, the threat of zombies lunging at you, the unforgettable, unapologetic game over screen. That's harsh. Damn. The various creatures and mutants running around the house and just overall feeling of terror the game gave you as you constantly ran out of ammo is more than enough to forever go down in creepy gaming history. Not just that, but Resident Evil was also one of the first games to feature notes. A cliche I've grown to hate, but I understand why they did it. Because of the hardware limitations and, and, not to mention, the first Resident Evil had one of the most memorable, epic moments in gaming history. The Sticky Paddle now brings to you epic moments in video game history. Now we here at the Sticky Paddle have already established the importance of the Resident Evil series for being groundbreaking in its time. The title was riddled with scary and memorable moments. I personally felt like there were several epic moments, but one in particular stands out. Early in the game, once entering the notorious Spencer Mansion in the Arkale Mountains, players were met with the series' first zombie. While it can be considered tame now, for its time this upcoming scene was terrifying. You gotta remember too, when it was released, most players had never seen anything like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you an epic moment in video game history.
again, may seem tame now by today's standards, but think about it. Horror games weren't as predominant then as they are today. Throw a rock now and you'll probably hit a new horror title, but back in 1997, most players at the time were accustomed to Mario or Sonic. Not this! I find it funny, as simple of a moment as it is, it has obviously left a lasting impression on the video game world. One that we are still talking about to this very day, over 20 years later. And this has been yet another epic moment in video game history, brought to you by the Sticky Paddle Game. Following the success of the first game, Capcom decided to capitalize and create a sequel. This installment was directed by Hideki Kamiya. Resident Evil 2 featured the new setting of Raccoon City and the haunting police station. Personally speaking, this is my favorite of the original trilogy. And for multiple reasons. Rather than returning as Jill Valentine and Chris Redfield, we now play as two new characters. Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield, sister of Chris from the first game. Leon is the new recruit for the RCPD, and Claire is searching for her brother who went missing after the mansion incident. It's interesting to note that the game was almost completely rebuilt after nearly being finished. Another creepy fun fact I found interesting, the ridiculously disturbing North American ads? Yeah, those were actually directed by the father of modern-day zombies himself, George Romero. I remember these commercials terrifying me as a kid, but at the same time, as scared as I was, I was intrigued. If you think about it, this could really be the origins of creepy gaming. That's probably another reason that this is my favorite of the original series. This was the first Resident Evil I ever played. That's right, I'll admit it, no shame in my game. It wasn't until after I beat RE2 that I finally got my young hands on an M-rated director's cut of the first game. My card castle does not condone this action. I don't think it was just that, though. The opening cutscene was terrifying, but it hooked you into the story. It's one thing for there to be a few zombie experiments roaming a mansion in the Arkelite Mountains, but now the Brain Eaters have hit the streets! Raccoon City has been completely taken over. Not just that, but the setting of this ridiculously elaborate police precinct was awesome. I enjoyed it more than the Spencer Mansion in the Arkelite Hills. It just felt like something out of Gotham City. And since advancements in the technology, the creature design was much scarier, in my personal opinion, as well. Much like the zombie's initial appearance in the first game, there was another cinematic that genuinely creeped me out. This nightmare generator is what is commonly called a liquor. And yes, that name is giggle-worthy. But the creature is not. Joseph! It might just be me, but these guys genuinely terrify me. I've had hypno-like dreams where there were like three chasing me. Ugh. Resident Evil 2 also introduced the characters Ada Wong, a future mainstay, as well as Mr. X. Look familiar? More on Mr. X and Nemesis than that eerie theory here in a bit. The game was two discs, just like its predecessor, so Capcom continued the tradition of replayability. One awesome unlockable is a minigame called The Fourth Survivor, where you play as a mysterious character simply known as Hunk. And yes, that's giggle-worthy too. Joseph! You are the remaining survivor of an Umbrella Task Force, similar to Stars. There's an interesting theory regarding Hunk that even ties into Resident Evil 7. Be sure to check out that video if you want to hear it. Now, I can talk about RE2 all day but we still have a lot to cover. I'm sorry, but Resident Evil 2 is an excellent survival horror game. 
I know I may be a little biased based on my own personal nostalgic memories, but how can I have an award-winning web series called Creepy Gaming and not at least mention these games? Awards pending. Regardless whether they have aged well or not, the terror was there. And in some places, still is. Resident Evil 3 this game has a very interesting backstory. The original concept for the third installment was meant to be a vast departure from the series. But much like Resident Evil 2, this project eventually got scrapped and developed into the franchise we know today as Devil May Cry. Once the original idea was changed, the development team was split into two separate groups. One team worked on Code Veronica, while the other worked on what we now know as Resident Evil 3. Overall, the game's okay, but it's not my favorite. The creepiest redeeming factor in this game, though, is Nemesis. He's this hulking, unstoppable brute, which is scary enough, but, well, just look at him! Tentacle porn mo It's like no matter what you do, there's no stopping him. He's a steroided out version of Mr. X, which is pretty cool because this game takes place at the same time as Resident Evil 2. You return in the role of Jill Valentine from the first game, and the basis of the game feels pretty lacking for the most part. As Jill, you were just supposed to outrun Nemesis and escape Raccoon City. Even though it's technically not, the game feels very linear. This title was on just one disc, and you just play as Jill for the most part. And to me, anyway, it just feels more like some side story, not deserving of being a numbered title. Again, just my opinion. There's a pretty cool creepy Easter egg before I move on, though. It's a nice touch that really connected RE2 and 3 even more so. Brad McVickers from the first game gets attacked and killed in Resident Evil 3. But if you know where to go under the stairwell outside of the police department in RE2, you will find who is believed to be Brad McVickers. But now, he has changed. Next up, as an honorable mention, Code Veronica. I won't talk about this one much. I know I said I was only going to cover the numbered titles, but personally speaking, I feel that this game deserves to be the true Resident Evil 3. It just has better all-around characters, more to it, and just furthers the ongoing plot. This game was only one disc as well, but that's because this game was released on the Sega Dreamcast. This installment was about Claire looking for her brother, Chris Redfield. The game was darker and scarier than previous installments, making this game stand out against the rest. The Rockford Island setting made the game feel more claustrophobic and creepy. We also got some questions answered regarding the Ashford family and series baddie Albert Wesker. Speaking of the Ashford family, there's a pretty creepy Easter egg regarding the Ashford family mansion. It looks nearly identical to the Spencer Mansion from the first game. Theories and speculation immediately arose amongst players. Was the mansion from the first game just some mock-up experiment? Resident Evil 4 Five long years, fans of the series had to wait to get a true follow-up to Resident Evil. Sure, there were a ton of sequels and spin-offs, but it wasn't until 2005 that gamers got the numbered sequel they had been waiting for. RE4 definitely shook things up, but stayed true to the series as well with many franchise themes returning. And to me, that's just a good sequel. It didn't hurt that the original game's creator Shinji Mikami returned to help with this project. Resident Evil 4 Five
five long years, fans of the series had to wait to get a true follow-up to Resident Evil. Sure, there were a ton of sequels and spin-offs, but it wasn't until 2005 that gamers got the numbered sequel they had been waiting for. RE4 definitely shook things up, but stayed true to the series as well with many franchise themes returning. And to me, that's just a good sequel. It didn't hurt that the original game's creator Shinji Mikami returned to help with this project. Much like its predecessors, this game went through four different development stages before we got the RE4 that we all now know. That's just crazy. Leon Kennedy returns in this installment. This guy has went all the way from a rookie cop to now Secret Service, as he is sent on a mission to save the president's daughter. The game's opening sets a dark, murky tone immediately. While searching, Leon stumbles onto this village. While there, he runs into these fine folks. Joseph! That's right, zombies are gone and now have been replaced with these infected folks. They are called Las Plagas, or Las Ganatos, which translates to cattle, but more specifically, the herd. No more mindless, slow, lumbering zombies. Los Ganados are infected individuals with cognitive skills, more agility, and heightened strength. Oh, and in case you didn't notice, they carry weapons, too. They took a risk with the location, and while different, it was great, just again, in my opinion. Certain staples of the series returned as well, making it feel like the sequel that we had all been waiting for despite the new locale. The traditional inventory system was back, now with a few upgrades. The memorable boss battles returned and just overall came together to make an amazingly awesome, amazingly creepy Resident Evil game. RE4 had other new additions as well, such as the cult aspect. Up until this point, we've battled the evil Umbrella Corporation. And while still present, they take a back seat to the immediate threat of the cult. I'd like to note that this is the first time to my knowledge that the Resident Evil series began to take this approach. It's kind of like the traveling merchant. RE4 introduces this shadowy salesman. There have been a lot of theories as to who or what this guy is. What the hell? Dude is always ahead of you. Yeah, really convenient and all, but how does he do that? It doesn't matter how far out of the way the game makes you travel. He will always, always be there before you are. Who is the strange shadowy salesman? And does he play a bigger part in the Resident Evil lore? Overall, RE4 is a great title. It won several Game of the Year awards. To me personally, the difficulty was just hard enough. The survival aspects came back in a big way. The boss battles were unforgettable. The gameplay was smooth. And most importantly, the game was actually scary. Oh, I miss that. RE4 was truly disturbing. It made me feel uneasy while playing it made me feel all dirty and gritty and dank and I loved it! Resident Evil 5 Alright, now we're getting into controversial territory. RE5 Most will agree they feel like this is when the series began its decline. You, once again, play as Chris Redfield. This time, the game is set in Africa. Yeah. I really don't have a lot to say about this game. Even though it was on a newer console generation than the previous installment, it still felt like a lackluster version of RE4. And I know what you're thinking. If it's so similar to 4 and you just liked it so much, why don't you like 5? <sighs> well, where to begin? First and foremost, just speaking personally, I thought the story was lacking and overall forgettable. 
Did anyone else notice how much of the game takes place in broad daylight? Yes, while Resident Evil 4 and 5 are similar, the setting is what makes all the difference. As I mentioned, Resident Evil 4 was a scary game. This one, not so much. I guess that brings us to the main complaint and argument. Many gamers, myself included, felt that this is when the series went more action-based rather than relying on its survival horror roots. To be fair to this title, it did have a few good boss fights. I will say this, I've played the game twice now. The first time was by myself and overall was a frustrating experience. The second time a buddy of mine was playing as well. This game shines in co-op. Resident Evil 5 was obviously built and meant to be played with someone else. It makes all the difference in the world. I'm not saying the game was terrible. I just, I guess I expected a little bit more from Resident Evil. Resident Evil 6 so earlier I mentioned the original Resident Evil trilogy, which is RE 1, 2, and 3. Although many people would trade out 3 for Code Veronica any day. 6 marks the end of the newer trilogy. Hell, I even thought it was the end of the franchise. Whether it was intended to be or not, RE 6 definitely felt like the final chapter. It was a return to form. After the controversial response from RE5, Capcom wanted to make the sixth installment more like the original trilogy. Zombies made their return, this mainly because of the resurgence of zombies in pop culture. The game returned to its darker roots, the tone, the setting, the music. All were great improvements from the previous installment. This is also the first time, to my knowledge anyway, that most of the main characters were all featured in the same game. That being said, there was still way too much action. I don't think it helped that Operation Raccoon City, another action-based Resident Evil game, came out around the same time as 6. This only muddied the waters. Players and fans of the series didn't want the mainstream action direction they were taking. We wanted to be scared. We wanted to feel the tension we felt in the original trilogy. We wanted to know the feeling of only having five bullets left. We wanted to witness the horror of something new, not rehashed, but the creepiness the Resident Evil series originally brought us. Is that so much to ask? It's okay. It's okay. Calm down, Mikey. It's okay. The redeeming factor of Resident Evil 6 was the story. Even though it was more horror than survival horror, the fact that effort was clearly put in made it an alright game. The story was split up into four character scenarios, all intertwined to create a larger story. You could play as Chris Redfield, Leon Kennedy, Ada Wong, and Jake Mueller, each with their own partner. This large narrative centered around the new C-Virus. You could tell this game was a true passion project. Whether or not they delivered, you could tell Capcom at least tried. I've been in this industry long enough. I've seen lots of games that are so polarizing. Some people love them, some people hate them. But I have never quite seen the response to a game like Resident Evil 6 had received. Reviews of the title range from one end of the spectrum to the other. That's why, especially when it comes to RE6, I just suggest gamers play it and judge it for yourself. To me personally, it's just okay. I think it receives a few extra bonus points for at least trying to return to the formula that made it so great to begin with. Joseph! In closing, the Resident Evil franchise has had its ups and downs. We had to give credit though. Without Resident Evil, Biohazard, we might not have the survival horror genre in gaming. It hit me while making this episode. The Resident Evil series is really subjective. 
These games can easily be viewed through both rose-tinted glasses and a skeptic's eye. I guess it really just depends on where you were at, how old you were, and what you were living through when you first played these games. I'll close out this special lengthy edition of Creepy Gaming just like I started it. People have asked, and I have now answered. What games have actually scared you, Mike? The original Resident Evil titles definitely go on that list. And because of that, the Resident Evil Anthology shall forever go down in creepy gaming history. Woo! Man, that was a long episode. That was a lot to cover, but there you have it. That's Resident Evil's one through six. Yes, I probably could have gone a little bit deeper into the Albert Wesker storylines or Umbrella Corporation, but I didn't want to spoil too, too much for those who haven't played the games yet. If you are new to the franchise, I strongly suggest Resident Evil's one, two, Code Veronica, and four. They're worthy just for the creepiness alone. Plus, there's a ton of sequels and spinoffs for you to choose from. First episode of Creepy Gaming Season 7 in the bag, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for helping this be possible. It's really a shame with the Capcom Resident Evil series or Biohazard or whatever you want to call it that, that um, it's really kind of formulaic, you know, and how they deviate from the formula from time to time but how it still continues to go on, you know? And, you know, speaking of formula, are we, are we picking that up? Does anybody else hear that? Oh, we are, we are. What is this, Southpaw Regional Wrestling? I thought we had some production quality around here. What the hell? Oh yeah, this show has a formula too. See you for Resident Evil 7. Peace! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, come on babies, I am Mullet Mike Hartcastle with the <laughs> Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming. In case you missed it or didn't happen to hear about it for some weird reason, this is the Season 7 Season Opener Double Feature. Today, we will be talking about Resident Evil 7. Or, or Biohazard 7 Resident Evil. Just depends on where you live. That was clever. If you didn't see it, then check out the first episode of Season 7 where I cover all the Resident Evil games up until this point. Or all the numbered ones anyways. Alright, I've been teasing it for months now. I'm not going to keep you waiting any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy games. Season seven. It was years for Resident Evil fans to get another numbered sequel. I didn't think it was going to happen. Yet. Here we are. Most people didn't know what to think about it when the trailer was first released. This looked like the furthest departure Capcom has taken with the series yet. Little did we know, this title was more like the original Resident Evils than we may have originally thought. I'll quickly go over the story for those who are unfamiliar, and don't worry, I won't get into spoilers until later when we talk about theories. And as always, I will give a fair warning with an official spoiler alert before I do. In this game, we play as Ethan, an all-new character. His wife, Mia, went missing. But after three years, Ethan receives this strange message. Ethan. You were right. I did lie to you. I shouldn't have. <laughs> All I can say is that if you get this, st 
day away. You start the game in the swamps of Louisiana looking for Mia. The creepiness then slowly sets in. While in the swamps, you come across the old Baker place. The stage is set and scares ensue. It's a perfect setup. Short, sweet, to the point. Here's your weapon, some herbs, some ration ammo. Good luck! I like that we play as Ethan, considering he's just a civilian. No police officer, no STARS member, no secret service. You're just a husband hellbent on finding his wife. While the game took a cosmetically different approach, many of the classic survival horror beats are there. The Old Baker Home is a great callback to the Spencer Mansion from the first game. The puzzles were a nice reminder of the original Resident Evil trilogy. As a matter of fact, this game has quite a few creepy easter eggs and references to past games in it. Let's discuss a few of these. The main hall of the Baker Home is very reminiscent of the mansion's main corridor. Not just that, but the game takes a little extra incentive here. In that very same room, you can find a painting of none other than the Arkalay Mountains themselves. While in the same room there, in the main hall, look for a newspaper with a headline that reads, 20 missing in two years. Eagle-eyed gamers would see the article was written by Elisa Ashcroft. If the name Ashcroft sounds familiar, well, it should. The character Elisa was originally in the spin-off Resident Evil Outbreak. Another easter egg that I thought was a nice touch also falls into the theory category as well. One of the only complaints I've heard about the game is that it doesn't tie in to the rest of the Resident Evil series that well. But just like the shadow puzzles in the game, it's a matter of perspective and where to look. Ethan even comments with a little rationality when he asks rhetorically who built this. Well, if you look in the attic area, you will find a particular note that reveals who built the puzzles. The answer? Chamberlain Construction. Chills literally ran down my spine when I figured it out. Chamberlain Construction was the same company that designed the puzzles in the original Spencer Mansion from the first game. Oh, what tangled webs we weave. Now, I do plan on discussing some of the game's scarier moments and give an overall review, but I'd say that the majority of my viewers prefer Easter eggs and theories, so let me address these first. That being said, though, I'm about to go into spoiler territory. So official creepy gaming spoiler! The main theory I want to address is regarding the game's ending. An umbrella helicopter shows up to rescue you. But the logo is now different, as if the company has rebranded and maybe changed their diabolical ways. What looks like STARS members rappel down from the helicopter as one of the figures slowly approaches you. It is none other than Chris Redfield himself. But here's where it gets strange. A lot of people question this because he simply says Redfield. Although, I'm pretty sure it's been confirmed by now that this is, in fact, Chris. But, did anyone notice the gear Redfield was wearing? More importantly, his helmet. This ties in with Resident Evil 2, so again, go watch my anthology video if you haven't already. RE2 featured a mini-game that introduced the Boba Fett of the Resident Evil series, Hunk. Quit snickering! Joseph! I know. Hunk. Anyway, there is a theory floating around suggesting that the big revelation of the game's ending was that Hunk was really Chris Redfield this entire time. If this theory is true, then it means that Chris was around during the events of Raccoon City in Resident Evil 2. Some fans of the series were let down by the ending, but if this theory is proven to be true, then the revelation makes it that much more special. All right, now that we're well into spoiler territory, let's talk some more creepiness. The Bakers! 
the Baker family, holy functional alcoholic Batman, while being an obvious homage to the family from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the Bakers stand out of the shadows as their own individual characters. Let's go through them one by one, shall we? First up, there's Jack Baker, the father. He was a former Marine who now can somehow regenerate. The answer to why he has that ability is revealed as the game goes on. You can find out more of this big brute's background from several pictures, newspaper articles, and yes, notes. Notes! Why is it always notes? Notes, 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 notes. All right, look, huh, to be fair, we have to give credit where credit's due because Resident Evil was one of the first games to actually introduce stupid notes into survival horror games. So, can't be too mad. Wait a minute. Of course I can be mad! It's your fault, Resident Evil! Give credit where credit's due. Give blame where blame is due! Ah! Next up, wife to Jack, Mama Baker, come on down. First name, Marjorie. Her ability, if you didn't notice, is to transform into this giant mutant fly woman with an extremely nasty larva sack, let me tell ya. Oh, I think I lost my appetite. The character design in this game is so disturbing. It's one of the game's creepier attributes. The new RE engine definitely adds a lot to this new installment. Moving on, there's the daughter, Zoe Baker. She's the one that tries to help you get the antidote and escape. Then there's her ever-charming brother, Lucas. He rides the lines of genius and madman. He's obviously a psychopath, but we learn throughout the game that he's an engineer of sorts even winning several awards and trophies as a child. Sticky shout out to the Maddie Cakes Project for pointing out to me that Lucas actually escapes. The game ends with him unaccounted for. The Baker family was obviously infected by a virus transferred by Evie, who I'll talk about in a minute. The family deep down wants to be cured, as we see in this weird cutscene. They just want to be a normal family again. It really makes them quite sympathetic by the end of the game. If you remember, though, Lucas didn't want to get reverted back. He didn't want the cure. This leaves me intrigued to see if this storyline gets followed up. Last but definitely not least, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the main event, Evie, or Evelyn. She's the creepy little paranormal girl. She's also the old lady in the baker's house we just assumed to be grandma. To try to avoid any confusion, I'll just use the name Evie in reference to the little creepy girl and Evelyn for her older self. Some fans of the series felt that Resident Evil 7 already looked too much like Silent Hill PT, but the addition of the quote-unquote ghost girl went too far for some folks. Personally speaking, I love the addition of Evie. She took the creepiness to new heights. While yes, she is a little more paranormal as far as like ghosts go than most Resident Evil characters, her condition, we'll call it, is at least backed up by some science. So that made it up for me. In a game where you have these boss fights with supernatural mutants, Evie suddenly doesn't seem so far-fetched now. She has some great moments in this game, both as Evie and as the elderly Evelyn. I gotta ask though, was the revelation spoiled for anyone else? If you watch the game's startup cinematic cutscene, it clearly shows Evelyn moving. See it? Right there. Look. Even with it spoiled, it didn't take anything away from it for me. I felt the developers handled the use of Evie very well for the most part. She was subtle and wasn't overused. 
Joseph! In closing, I'd like to give a really brief review. As I mentioned earlier, there are some who feel this is too much of a departure from the series. Personally, I thought it was a great return to formula, all while adding new aspects. That's what a good sequel is, right? Capcom took a risk with this game, much like they did with 4. They got the setting right with this one, which tends to make or break the game. It had a real dark tone, not just mere jump scares. Overall, I really enjoyed it. I need to mention too that this is one of the first PlayStation 4 games that the VR was optional. Usually it's one or the other, but with RE7 you could play with or without the headset. I played in both fashions, alternating throughout the game. I will say this, without VR, it's just a good old survival horror game. But VR cranks up the creepiness. A lot. Now, I'm not saying it's like Rush of Blood scary, but it definitely makes all the difference in the world. It's really almost like comparing apples to oranges. Overall, damn good game. I'm happy to see the series make a grand return. Because of the tone, atmosphere, music, design, Evie, the bakers, the many theories, and the horrifying VR experience, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard has done more than enough to forever go down in creepy gaming history. Season 7 is off to a great start. Thank you all so much for help making this all possible, because without you, there is no need. I just like to point out that I got a lot of stuff planned for this season of creepy gaming. That's right, we have 100 episode coming up this season. Just wow. Not only that, I'm also going to try to make a point to shake things up, change formulas around a little bit, and go back to the show's roots and follow more Easter eggs and creepy pasta. One, thank you all so much for watching. I am Mullet My Car Castle with the. Battle Gaming Network saying, Sticky, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Hardcastle here with Sticky Paddle Gaming Network, bringing you another edition of Creepy Gaming. Now, we like to have a lot of fun here on the show. We like to goof around and just cut up, be stupid and obnoxious. That's what I'm best at, after all. But today's game, I can't take this one too lightly. So, this was. I just keep finding a hard way to approach this episode. I've been wanting to do it for a long time, but I thought it kind of just almost went too far. But I think now is the appropriate time to do it. Uh, the craze has kind of died off. This was real big a year or two ago, so it's kind of died off now. The curiosity is not as uh, intriguing as it once was. And if anything, I hope you're watching this video so you don't go seek out this game for yourself. <sighs> Today, in Creepy Gaming, we are covering Sad Satan. A lot of people requested this episode, but at first, I just again, I didn't feel right doing it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna throw any plugs. I'm not cracking any jokes this episode. So let's just dive right in, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. <laughs> Ooh. 
Sad Satan was an indie horror game that surfaced in 2015. You play as an unknown figure in this strange black and white world. You walk through these bizarre, narrow corridors while occasionally running across these disturbing children. The sound design is absolutely horrifying. It is even said to leave players disoriented, very similar to Pokemon's Lavender Town Syndrome. Sad Satan is a deep web game. If you're unfamiliar with the deep web or dark web, then check out my buddy Mudahar's channel, Some Ordinary Gamers, if you haven't already. It'd probably be the safest way to satisfy your curiosity. That's another reason why I'm making this video. I didn't want to cover it at first because I felt like it would just make people want to seek this game out more. But now, two years later, I feel like the buzz surrounding the game has finally died down a little. Plus, I'm hoping if anyone is wanting to seek out this game that they find all the information they need right here in this safe edition of Creepy Gaming. The gameplay, or lack thereof, is meant to be an uncomfortable, disorienting, unsettling experience. As I mentioned, the monochromatic visuals alone could cause such an effect, but the sound design will leave you unnerved. At first, you'll just hear the sound of your character's footsteps, but as you progress through the maze of corridors, you will begin to hear some strange audio clips. Voices are heard, screams ring out, music clips play backwards. It's terrifying. It is even said that the screams were from actual victims. I'll delve deeper into the audio in a bit, but first let me finish talking about the gameplay. While navigating the maze, images would suddenly pop up. At first, they seem random, like this picture of former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. After playing, some gamers claim Sad Satan would make their PC sluggish or even render them unresponsive. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this game, you're probably thinking it just sounds like some stereotypical gaming creepypasta. This is where the game Sad Satan goes from creepy to controversial. It is widely believed that Sad Satan is a game about child abuse, pedophilia, and murder. All actions that I do not condone and personally speaking find it rather sickening. This is why I have been so hesitant to talk about this disgusting indie title. The game surfaced on the YouTube channel Obscure Gaming Corner. A subreddit was then formed to break down the game, theorize, and try to solve the sick puzzle that was Sad Satan. From what I've gathered, there are two versions of the game. A safe version and an illegal unsafe version. Remember the audio I mentioned earlier? It really makes you wonder if the screams were that of real victims. The audio clips that play randomly are said to be that of accused murderers such as Charlie Manson, just for an example, although this is disputed. There is also a claim that the game uses binary beats and even alleged number stations, all of which could create a feeling of nausea or uneasiness. Audio reversal, or backmasking, plays a big part in the game. As a matter of fact, people wondered where the name Sad Satan derived from. One theory is that it comes from Led Zeppelin's song Stairway to Heaven. The legend goes that if you play the song backwards, you'll supposedly hear a satanic message. I'm going to attempt to play a backmask clip of Stairway to Heaven if YouTube permits. This is the verse that allegedly references Sad Satan. I will provide you with the supposed words on the screen. I'm all in with the wash day, I'm in us. 
What seemed like seemingly random images ended up being much, much more. From what I understand, the unsafe version features pictures of alleged sexual predators such as Jimmy Seville, as well as graphic images of child abuse and random gore. It was almost like a video game version of a snuff film. But what was its purpose, and who created such a disturbing game? Sad Satan is still that of mystery. Some claim that it was all just a mere hoax. Others swear they've seen the unsafe version. I don't know what to make of it all because honestly, I've never played the game, nor do I want to. Even if it did end up being some kind of twisted hoax, I still find it sick. Video games are a big part of my life. I find them relaxing and can be a great form of escapism. I like them. I even like creepy games, obviously, but this goes too far for me. Video games are supposed to be fun, even the scary ones. Sad Satan is a gross demonstration of human capabilities. Sadly, because of the buzz surrounding the controversy of the game, Sad Satan goes into the deepest, darkest corner of creepy gaming history. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, free and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike Hardcastle with the Battle Gaming Network and Full Screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming Episode 100. Are you kidding me? So, I've been teasing it for a while, and I'll do it, fine, I agree to it, why not, because I'm an idiot. But since it is the 100th episode of Creepy Gaming, I've agreed... I can't even say. I have agreed to shave my... Oh, God. I can't. Okay, I have agreed to shave my beard if there is such a blade strong enough. Not only that, but I'm gonna take off my hat and I'm also gonna shave my head because I In this creepy gaming special, rather than covering just one single game or a series of games, we're gonna cover a bunch. I'm gonna make something I haven't made in a long time that everybody makes and I've refused to and I've fought it. But then I stopped and thought this would be great for episode 100. <sighs> Today, we will be doing the top 10 creepiest things in gaming. And I want to reiterate, this isn't a compilation episode. I'm going to be producing new content on everything that I cover in this top 10. I'm excited about episode 100, but I kind of want to prolong it because I just know i got to shave my beard. <laughs> Oh, shit. In the arms of the angel. All right, so let's go ahead and get the show started. At the end of the episode. Turn the lights down, boy. As we journey into episode 100 of Creepy Gaming. Thanks to you. After 100 episodes of creepy gaming, I can say I've seen some pretty disturbing video game moments. It was really difficult to make this list. After asking you, the viewers, and hours of deliberation, I feel that we have comprised a near-perfect list. 
Now, some people not familiar with the series who just clicked on this video, for example, may be a little confused. Allow me to try to clear this up before we begin. This is a top 10 list of episodes from my show. This list will be comprised of various Easter eggs, creepypasta, scary moments, disturbing games, and eerie theories. If your idea of the scariest moment in a video game isn't on this list, it might be something I haven't covered on this show. Besides, this list is based on my viewers and my own personal opinions of the scariest episodes and shocking revelations of creepy gaming history. Whether you're new or a long-time veteran, let me know your scariest video game moment down below. I would also like to note that this isn't just a compilation of re-uploads, but with all new written content. I've had a lot of people ask me to do follow-up episodes or revisit certain episodes. Other than maybe a future creepy gaming extra, this will probably be the most quote-unquote revisiting that I'll be doing considering there is so much out there left to cover. With that said, let's dig in. I said dig in, not dig dug. Number 10. GTA 5 Ghost Girl. Yes, there have been myths and legends of ghost girls in video games for years now. Some true, most are not. They're almost like notes in a horror game. They're everywhere now! Some seem creepier than others though, like number 10 on our list. The good people at Rockstar Games have always filled their open world titles with various easter eggs. Whether it be the older GTA games or Red Dead Redemption, there were always murmurs of so-called haunted areas. In 2013's Grand Theft Auto V, the developers quit teasing and delivered with this lovely lady. Not just that, but the folks at Rockstar even gave her a backstory, making it that much creepier. Now, if only I could get a mullet Mike Easter egg in a future Rockstar game, my life would be complete. Number 9 Five Nights at Freddy's The ghost girl from GTA 5 made you feel uneasy. God forbid you accidentally ran into her without knowing about her first. The next game on our list brought a different kind of fear to the table. Tension No matter how divisive or watered down the series has become, the original Five Nights at Freddy's was scary to myself and most players at the time. It fed off of the childhood fears of many gamers out there. This title was different. It was original. Well, okay, at the time anyway. Yes, this title featured several jump scares, but the game was creepiest to me when I could hear footsteps or laughter. The anticipation would build, the tension would grow, creating its own form of fear. The once humble little series blew up and turned into a huge franchise seemingly overnight. But true fans will never forget the original indie title that brought us to the pizza parlor in the first place. Number 8 Super Mario Galaxy 2 Hell Valley Sky Trees Mario is no stranger to this show, probably appearing more times than any other video game character has. Most have been fan-made creepypastas, but this next entry on our list came from Nintendo themselves. In Super Mario Galaxy 2, in the Shiverburn Galaxy, looking up to the top of the cliffs, you will see these strange figures. At first glance, you might get a weird feeling, but they don't move and they aren't featured anywhere else in the game. So why were they in the game? What was Nintendo's intentions with this otherwise family-friendly title? It wasn't until you dig a little deeper that you'll discover the proverbial rabbit hole. This is when it might freak you out. Diving into the game's files showed us the figure's name. The Hell Valley Sky Trees. There were so many questions to ask, I didn't even know where to begin. It wasn't until I dug up some more information that I found out about a similar looking figure in Super Mario 3D Land. This one, in the trees. After more research, I found out about the Kadama from Japanese folklore. They are tree spirits. 
and like a puzzle, the pieces begin to fit together, making this one of the freakiest episodes of creepy gaming that I've ever worked on. Number 7 Half-Life 2 G-Man and Reversed Audio Any game that features some interdimensional being like G-Man definitely deserves to be on this list. The fact that he would follow you throughout the game left players leery. Who was this man and what was his purpose? Sadly, the dreams of Half-Life 3 are dimming more and more each passing year. It's beyond a joke now. As Jim Cornette would say, it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. While most of the episode revolved around G-Man, what really creeped me out the most about Half-Life 2 was the reversed zombie audio. There's just something about the screams of agony mixed with backmasked audio that really seems to leave you a little unnerved. Speaking of unnerving, our next entry can be categorized as such. Number 6 The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask Oh, here we go again, Nintendo. Okay. What part of Majora's Mask is so creepy, you ask? Is it the monstrous moon? The Doomsday Clock? The Termina Theory? The Ben Drown Creepypasta? Tingle? Here you go. How about all of it? For a Nintendo title, this game was terrifying. Especially as a little kid who just beat Ocarina of Time and then jumps into... This! Jeez! Even with all the usual creepiness Nintendo put into the game themselves, it's the Ben Drown creepypasta that probably scared me the most. I'd like to note, this is before I knew Jed Usable Alex Hall himself, the writer of Ben Drowned. At the time, a lot of people believed these stories to be real. It was a lengthy plot with plenty of substance and corresponding gameplay. I've already talked about it to nauseam, so I'll try not to repeat myself more than I do already. All of these episodes are available in full on the Paddle Gaming Network. I'll try to link them all in the description below. So, get it, Link? I'll just link them all. There'll be a bunch of links in the description. You see what I'm doing there? <laughs> that joke sucked. Sorry, okay? Give me a break. It's episode 100. Come on. Surely I've earned a little leeway now. If you want to hear more about Ben Drowns, you can check it out there. The only thing that I can really add right now that I didn't then was that the story continued on from where I left off. Like, for example, there was an ARG. And I'm not going to lie, but Alex's King Kong video is pretty funny. Check that one out, too. But just know I mainly wanted to focus more on the video game aspects, the Majora's Mask aspects, as opposed to the ever-growing narrative. I will repeat myself on this statement. Ben Drown was one of the first gaming creepypastas and truly laid the groundwork for writers to come. Number 5 LSD Dream Emulator if you've noticed, so far on this list, I've tried to show different types of fear with each entry. Been Drowned was the fear of possibly being real. Five Nights at Freddy's was all about tension. The GTA Ghost Girl was eerie. LSD Dream Emulator is fear of the bizarre. Wow. Just wow. I can't even begin to count the WTF moments in this game. This title really plays with your mind, and I guess that's the point of it, right? It's just so bizarre, 
And whatever you do, don't play this game for hours right before you go to bed. Sweet jalopy butt mites! What is going on here? This game really evokes Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. The creepiest part of the game is that it's not just a dream emulator, but a nightmare generator too. But they don't tell you that part! Throw in the infamous Shadow Man and you have one of the creepiest gaming moments I've ever experienced. Much like our next entry. Number 4 Until Dawn, Rush of Blood All I gotta say about this title is this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ashamed. This game was relentlessly terrifying. It was a pure adrenaline rush, hence the game's name. This title would have been ranked way higher on the list, but this game was VR only. Personally speaking, I feel like a game doesn't necessarily need to be VR to be scary. It just helps. I mean, I've had 2D games scare me more than this. VR was just more of an invasive experience. This was one of my more recent episodes. It was featured in the 2016 Halloween special where I discussed several VR games, but all failed in comparison to Rush of Blood. Rather than me just repeat myself again, how about I let the game do the talking? Oh my god, oh my god! No, oh. no, no. You're gonna be so up in my face! <laughs> <laughs> oh, god. Oh, whoa. oh my god, this is awesome, and those are baby dolls! Number 3 Silent Hill and Resident Evil Yeah, yeah, I know. Two entire franchises with seemingly nothing to do with each other for one entry? Well, yeah. Coming in at number 3 is both Resident Evil and and Silent Hill franchises. Part of the reason I decided to make this list is because I constantly get asked which games have scared me the most. Resident Evil brought us survival horror, whereas Silent Hill games brought us psychological terror. Two more great examples of different types of fear. I'll never forget the first time I played Silent Hill felt like the end of innocence. I may have started the game as a boy, but I finished it as a man. You know what's a real shame is I've only got a chance to cover the first game in the series. I'd really like to cover its sequel, Silent Hill 2. I, as a matter of fact, it's one of my favorite games. Unfortunately, the IP is owned by a certain company that shall not be named. So yeah, maybe one day. Either way, the eerie atmosphere, strange lore, haunting music, and nightmare-inducing moments, Silent Hill definitely goes on this list. If you're wondering why I lumped Resident Evil in this entry, is because of their similarities. Granted, they are vastly different games, but they came out around the same time. They were both released on the original Sony PlayStation, and they helped make horror games turn into franchises and eventually grow into its own subgenre. Both of these series did plenty not only to earn a place in my heart, but to earn their place in creepy gaming history. Number 2 Sonic CD Whereas our last entry might not have aged well, Sonic CD still somehow continues to grow in creepiness. There were a number of factors that made this game so disturbing. The infamous Majin screen, the American Game Over music, the satanic Sonic, or Sanic. After seven seasons and 100 episodes, I still have people come up to me and tell me how much that moment creeped them out. And I always agree. I'm sorry but this beats the numerous Sonic creepypastas I've covered, mainly because this was put into the game by Sega. While many believe this to be some inside joke by developers or one of Sega's various anti-piracy screens, 
These enigmatic sound tests still remain a mystery to this very day. Now, for old time's sake, let's check out that sound test accompanied by the eerie American soundtrack. Enjoy. Honorable Mentions Before we go any further, let me just address that I won't be including Polybius, Berserk, and especially Sad Satan. We'll just call that a dishonorable mention. We have discussed several forms of fear in this special episode. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to use the example of the Uncanny Valley. So I'll use it now. Attack on Titan. Enough said. The various Mario and Sonic creepypastas I covered definitely deserve a mention, especially the creepypasta simply known as Mario. We spoke earlier about Red Dead Redemption. It almost made this list with the ghost town of Tumbleweed and the stranger from the I Know You mission. Finally, nearly making the list was the strange sounds from Nintendo's Splatoon. That's a pretty creepy moment. Oh, what? I'm still not shaving yet. You better believe I'm waiting as long as I can before I have to shave. Now, before we get to number one, the steak dinner of this 10 course meal, let's recap the list of nightmare fuel. Number 10, GTA 5 Ghost Girl. Number 9, Freddy Mick's Stupid Face. Number 8, Super Mario Galaxy 2 Hell Valley Sky Trees. Number 7, Half-Life 2, G-Man and the Screams He Left in His Wake. Number 6, Majora's Mask. The entire game. Number 5, LSD Dream Emulator. Number 4, I Just Poop My Pants. Number 3, both Resident Evil and Silent Hill franchises. Number 2, Sonic CD. Sanic. And number 1, Pokemon. Hypno's Lullaby. Come, little children, come. Okay. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Enough. Kill it. Turn it off. I, I can't listen to this again. Are you serious? Is, is it getting louder? Oh, come on. Cut the music. Jeez, thanks. Nintendo, congrats! You've somehow managed to make this list not once, not twice, but three times! It's the hat trick, folks. This further proves my point that creepy stuff in family-friendly games just makes it that much creepier. Hypno is a Pokemon, but unlike the other cute little Pikachus and Jigglypuffs that most people know, this one likes to feed off of dreams, hypnotize children, and carry them off into the night. What he does with them must be read between the lines. It didn't help that there was Hypno's lullaby as well. The charming lyrics you heard just a second ago accompanied by the Lavender Town theme. Ugh. As a matter of fact, there is a lot of creepiness in the Pokemon series. You just have to know where to look. It was a close call between Hypno and Sonic CD, but I'm sorry, Sanic. Hypno took the top spot for one determining factor. Some of you may remember while working on that series of Pokemon episodes, I actually had a nightmare involving Hypno. I still don't care if you believe me or not, but I feel like most of my viewers know me well enough to know that I wouldn't make something like that up. Let's relive that dream turned nightmare. While working on this project, I had been staying up late at night, writing, researching wikis and Pokedex entries, and stumbled on to the anonymously recorded lullaby. I listened to it and legitimately got freaked out. And if you know me, if you know the show, then you know I don't say that about everything, especially creepypastas. When I finally fell asleep that night, I dreamt of Hypno, and he was no cartoon character as portrayed in today's episode. 
He was a beast. In my dream, we were on a stone spiral staircase of what seemed like a brick tower. I was a few stories above him, but behind him stood a line of six children, dazed, hypnotized, blindly following him in a single file line. Hypno with pendulum in hand stopped, as did the children. I remember being terribly frightened in my dream, frozen in fear. The next thing I know is Hypno made eye contact with me, and that was it. I woke up from the nightmare, set up in bed very quickly in a cold, cold sweat. In closing, I just wanted to say thank you all. Being episode 100, we wanted to try to help raise awareness. We figured we might have a few more eyes on us than we normally would. So again, please, if you feel the need, donate to the charities linked below. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I say it a lot, but that's because I sincerely mean it. Every time you've clicked one of my videos, you've helped support me. This is my job. This is what I happily do for a living. If it weren't for you, the dedicated viewers, I wouldn't be able to support my family. So again, I thank you for letting 100 episodes be possible. Looking back, before my sons were even born, I remember working on season one, and I never dreamed I'd be here today. And it's all because of you fine folks. I say it from the bottom of my heart, not as Mullet Mike, but as Mike Hardcastle. Thank you. I am humbled. I am flattered. I am grateful. I hope you've enjoyed 100 episodes of Creepy Gaming. That is a lot of content. I would like to thank everyone who has helped me throughout these seven seasons, throughout these 100 episodes. Thank you all so much. Well, that's gonna do it for episode 100 of Creepy Gaming. I'm not gonna do my typical outro, keep it sticky, stay creepy, thanks for watching. Instead, we're just gonna to cut to that beautiful bean footage of me shaving my beard. And don't worry, folks, it'll grow back. Like, give, give me like a week, okay? Well, I guess it's time. Look, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. The 100th episode of Creepy Gaming. And as I said, I will be shaving my head and this beautiful beard of mine. Said I'd do it. Yeah, this is cat. This is cat. <laughs> you know what? Since it's a special occasion, I'll have somebody else do it. These are my sons. They're going to shave my head. I'm regretting it already. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my card castle here with the paddle. I just have 10 words to say to you. It's every very good to see you again, old friends. What the hell? Welcome to Creepy Gaming, folks. Episode 101. I'm good. I would like to thank everybody who helped support, watched, shared the links, and donated for episode 100. Thank you all so much read the comments, you really got me here guys.
All kidding aside, I really mean it. Thank you for your kind words. It means a lot. Won't lie, I had a rough week, so you guys definitely helped me through it. So, episode 101. Well, I thought since, you know, we finished up the list last week. Spoilers! With uh, Hypno. That this week... Oh, boy, what a downgrade. This week, we're going to be covering the mobile game. Pokemon Magic Carp Jump. At first, when I first got these requests, I'm not going to lie, I thought they were really silly. I was like, what could possibly be creepy about this? But, as always, whenever y'all suggest something, I'm never disappointed, so... Thank you for that. But as a nice segue from episode 100, ending with Hypno, spoilers, we're going to go to a Magic Carp. It's like the lamest Pokemon there is. Over 100 episodes, and this is the first mobile game I've ever covered. Probably going to be the last day. So without any further ado, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Pokemon Magic Carp Jump. This is a new low. I've never jumped so low in my life. Please cue the theme music. Would you believe me if I said there was a ghost girl in the Pokemon Magic Carp jump game? Of course you would! Why not? Unless maybe you're not familiar with the series, and in that case, let me quickly explain. Going back as early as the first Pokemon games with the quote-unquote white hand reference, creepy aspects have been riddled throughout the series. Well, why wouldn't I think the smartphone app would feature at least one of these aspects? I'm not much of a mobile gamer. I prefer a good console or a good handheld. But because so many of you did suggest this, I thought I'd at least give it a try. The game is as stupid as it sounds. After the success of... <sighs> Mario Run, and even worse, Pokemon Go, Get it out of my face. Nintendo decided to double down in the mobile market with Pokemon Magic Carp Jump. And when I say the game is stupid, well, that's because it's supposed to be. For Pokemon fans, we know the Magic Carp is purposely one of the lamest Pokemon. That's why I was so surprised that out of all the IPs Nintendo owns that this is what they go with. I guess we can thank Pokemon Go for that. I hate Pokemon Go. Put your phone down. Pay attention Anyway, to the, road. the game is simple. As a Pokemon trainer, you are tasked by the mayor to raise a magic carp and train it for jumping competitions. It's kind of like a virtual pet, I suppose. The funniest thing about the game, though, is the fact that you pretty much do nothing. You literally just tap the screen. And no, it's not like prompts or quick time events. You literally just tap the screen. You are telling your magic carp to jump. And that's it. It's similar to games like Click Heroes or Punch Club. So you and your magic crap basically just train and battle throughout the various leagues. But hey, just because it's a stupid game doesn't mean it can't be fun. While playing throughout the leagues, you will occasionally come across a random encounter. These encounters are usually some stranger offering items or advice. Here's where the otherwise kid-friendly game gets a little eerie. 
In this title's main HUD, go to the top of the pond and click on the TV seven times and you will see a static screen. Click it seven more times, a total of 14, and you will experience this random encounter involving this ghost girl. Players believe her to be the same or at least similar to the ghost girl from Pokemon X and Y, although she does appear to look different. To me, the creepiest part about it is that you hear this nice, upbeat music and then nothing. Nothing. Pure silence. Yet another aspect that alludes to her being at least related to the previous Ghost Girls from the series. And I will say this, your first encounter with her can get pretty awkward. What the hell? So as you may have noticed, you have the option to stay or leave. If you hit leave the first time, you get a free level up. If you choose to stay, your magic carp's toughness will increase, but you still eventually got to leave. Creepy stuff in Pokemon is it's nothing new, okay? Ooh. You know, it's no secret there's been creepy stuff in Pokemon games, ranging back to the originals, even. Point being is, if Nintendo put creepy stuff in the video games over 20 years ago for their handhelds, chances are they're doing it 20-something years later on mobile phones. I've noticed a lot of players claim this to be some kind of poltergeist easter egg with the TV and all, but personally, wouldn't it make more sense if it was an easter egg in reference to the ring? Think about it. These Pokemon Ghost Girls carry all the traits of Japanese folk. You must click the TV seven times to get static, just like in the ring that you'll die in seven days. Click it another seven times to trigger the random encounter. And wait a minute, what is it that the ghost girl says? That was the same thing the creepy Marowak says in the original games. And Magic Carp, it just now hit me. Look at this word. Carp, as in the fish, is spelled with a C, not a K. So is it magic with a K? Is it black magic? Is Nintendo studying the black arts? What the fuck? After all, I mean, don't judge Nintendo. I'm freaking out. I gotta calm down. Oh, I'm gonna black out. I'm getting a little faint. Oh, I'm getting a little faint. Okay. I'm alright. I'm alright, sorry, I got a little worked up. Five years of creepy gaming will do that to you. We'll do that to anyone. Overall, Pokemon Magikarp Jump is, like I said, a stupid game. But hey, there's a lot of stupid games out there and a lot of times they're pretty fun. It's really the player's choice. The Creepy Ghost Girl has been around for a while now, as far back as at least Pokemon X and Y, as far as I recall. There you go, Nintendo putting another creepy easter egg in a family friendly game. Go figure. I say keep doing it Nintendo, I'm loving it. I'd like to note too real quick that sometimes I've actually heard people say that they didn't do the TV thing at all. 
So maybe that's just the most common way to access it, but there's possibly other ways to access this random encounter. Overall, it's an all right game. The creepy ghost girl really makes up for it. But I guess my only complaint, besides the fact that it's on mobile, is the fact that Nintendo just never seems to follow up on their Easter eggs. It's like the Hell Valley Sky Trees. No closure whatsoever. What's that? Hold on. We got late breaking news. As this episode is recording, folks, this is late breaking news. Stay tuned. No. No. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there is a new Pokemon game that is about to be announced. And it is supposed to deal with the supernatural. Let's take a look at that real quick. Ted, do you have that footage? some side game Pokemon mystery something or other I guess we're gonna find out but it features the hex girl it shows her at the very end Ted play that clip oh, that's awesome we never have late breaking news on creepy gaming I feel kind of special well there you go thanks Nintendo you, you listened before this video was even out you listened so we're going to have a follow-up to the Hex Girl, the Ghost Girl. Cool. Oh, no, that means we have to do another episode on it. Right. Oh, it's weird. Why do I keep passing out? Must be getting sick or something. That made perfect sense, and you know it. Well, that's going to do it, folks. Episode 101 of Creepy Gaming is in the bag. I am Mike Hardcastle. This is my beard. We both thank you for watching. Stay, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. YouTuber has done this for the game. Oh, silly me. And here I thought, wearing a hockey mask and carrying a machete for the Friday the 13th games would be original. <laughs> silly me. How stupid. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and jerks alike, I am Mullet Mike. What the Paddle Gaming Network and full screen bringing you Creepy Gaming Halloween Special Friday the 13th. As you may be able to tell, I've been thinking about it for a long time. And I've been looking back at season seven and I've realized it's been very gimmicky. Yeah, gimmicks everywhere. I mean, if you think about it, Resident Evil was a double feature. Then we had the 100th episode, and it's, it was just always something. So, just like season three was the season of highly requested episodes, this, my friends, season seven will be the season of gimmicks. Oh, yeah.
I guess y'all realized I wasn't Jason. That kind of blew it. Oh. All right, well, that's fine. We can improvise. We can improvise. That is quite all right. Ladies and gentlemen, today I've been so excited to bring you these episodes. I mean, like, really excited. Got to work on them as soon as I could so I could have them out for Halloween. Today we will be covering the original Friday the 13th games. And if you noticed, yes, I said games. Most people remember the 1989 LJN Classic. And don't get me wrong, this is the game I grew up with, too. But there was a little-known Friday the 13th game that was released in 1985 that we'll be talking about today as well. So, without any further ado, folks, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. <laughs> These haunting syllables have echoed in my dreams for years now. Jason, Friday the 13th, one of the most popular slasher franchises of all time. It should be no surprise that I'm a big fan of horror films. Out of all the old slashers, Jason Voorhees has always been one of my favorites. Some people feel like he's just some large, clunky, lumbering brute like Frankenstein's monster. And he has been portrayed that way before. But there is so much more to Jason and the Friday the 13th lore. Before I go any further, I'm going to spoil these movies horribly. So if you haven't seen the original Friday the 13th films, then why are you watching this? Seriously. It's October, go check them out and come back and watch this video. You'll thank me for it. Or you won't. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. The reason I like the character of Jason Voorhees so much is because of his motivation. Think about it. He basically saw his mom get her head cut off. Just saying. Now he is on a killing spree against every camp counselor he can find. Or... Anyone, for that matter, really. I've tried for years now to somehow incorporate the Friday the 13th NES game into creepy gaming, but felt it just wasn't quite creepy enough. I thought it was very subjective, and maybe it was only creepy to me. But now that there's a new Friday the 13th game, and considering the time of the year, I thought, literally, what better time than now? Some people know, some people don't, but Jason's first video game appearance wasn't in the NES game, but rather the rarely mentioned 1985 title. This was available for the Commodore 64 as well as the ZX Spectrum and the Amstrad. While few people know about this obscure horror title, it does hold a special place in creepy gaming history. Allow me to explain. The game itself is... Mm, crude, to say the very least. It plays a lot like Halloween or Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the Atari, but the ZX version featured some important aspects. If you're unfamiliar, these old Commodore and Spectrum and Amstrad games, they all required you to enter these codes to play. You could find these codes in the manual as well as a few hints, too. Some games even put hints just right on the back of the box, even. As a matter of fact, let's see what the back of this one says. Read this first. Before playing the game, make sure that you, one, close and lock all doors, windows, and curtains, Two, turn off all lights and use candle if necessary. Three, make sure 
Granny isn't in the room. Four, set the computer volume at maximum. So they're basically saying turn the lights down and the volume up. Then load and play the game. You will be surprised. Okay, let's try that out real quick. Let's see what happens. So let me turn it up here. As far as I know, this is the first screamer or jump scare in a video game. Now, I'm the kind of guy who doesn't mind being corrected, so please, if you know of a video game screamer before this, let me know. I would love to find one before 1985. I mean, this screamer, this jump scare, is older than I am. The ZX version also featured these pretty graphic images for the time. Like this guy with a machete in his forehead. Yeah, that happened. Uh, how did I not know about this? This game was definitely before my time. It was before a lot of people's time. Probably why no one really talks about it anymore. It wasn't until 1989 that we got the Friday the 13th game most players remember. This NES game scared me just as much as the movies did. I remember playing this as a kid. Get this! The preschool I went to had an NES. I guess it was someone's old out-of-date console that they must have donated or something. Do you know what games were available at this daycare that will remain nameless? The first Super Mario Brothers and Friday the f***ing 13th! At a daycare! I swear I couldn't have been five years old. I remember the cool kids, or at least the coolest you could be at that age anyway, sneaking around the game. Almost like if an adult knew that we had this, that they would take it away immediately. Oh, but look how colorful it is. The mentality of the time was, hey, it's just a Nintendo game. Some stupid kid's toy. If only they knew what they did to our fragile young minds. Ruined childhood? More like my childhood barely got started. I have to make an official creepy gaming redaction. I've praised the Resident Evil series in the past for being groundbreaking and being one of the first of its kind. We praise Clock Tower and Alone in the Dark for the same reasons. But, wait a minute. It just hit me. I, I must have somehow blocked it or repressed it from my childhood, but there were horror games a long time ago. Like Texas Chainsaw on the Atari 2600. Or what about Nightmare on Elm Street on NES? But what about the Halloween Atari 2600 game? I must have repressed all of this. Ruined childhood? Barely having a childhood? More like my childhood never even started! The gameplay is about what you would expect from the time. You pick from a selection of six camp counselors, each of which has their own attributes. Some can jump higher, some are faster. Sound familiar? The basis of the game is to defeat Jason before all the counselors and children die. Wait a minute, what'd the script say? Here, hand me that. Hand me that. No, here. Okay. Lose you. Before all the counselors and children die. Children die! In an NES game! Since when did Jason start killing kids? Counselors, yeah, that's one thing, but kids? 
I don't even think he killed kids in the movies. Sure, sure, there was young Tommy Jarvis, and then in part five, Jason was going to kill that one kid, but he escaped. And that was Roy anyways. That's not the point. That's not the point. Children die in this Nintendo game. What a great game to play as a kid in daycare. If you look at the game's map, you'll notice the three cabins by the lake. Go there if you want to see the children. They're creepy in their own right. Look at these faceless little freaks. The music doesn't help either. All kidding aside, the game's music is disturbing, but great. It sets the mood and tone very well, and for some reason has always stuck with me over the years. While exploring Camp Crystal Lake, you must gather items and fight... Ugh, zombies. Yep. Zombies. Even back then, you must also battle crows, bats, and wolves. The scariest aspect of the game, though, is obviously Jason Voorhees. He seemingly shows up out of nowhere. It's especially creepy when you're just wandering around a dark cabin, and then all of a sudden, BAM! It doesn't help that we get this weird music cue, either. This used to terrify me as a kid. <sighs> okay, fine, it still does! Tension slowly builds. You know you're going to hear that music any minute. And when you do, your heart feels like it will beat out of your own chest. While many players think Jason just randomly appears, he actually has more of a pattern than most people think. Fire. Find the flame. The torch is your best friend in this NES classic. It deals the most damage against Jason. In this title, you must defeat him a total of three times. I remember when I was younger, I finally beat him. Only to find that he'd return again like the great slasher villain he is. There's some pretty cool references and easter eggs in this game, but one creepy easter egg, especially considering it was 1989, was Pamela Voorhees. If you know where to look in the woods, you will actually find Jason's mother's decapitated head. Not just that, but it somehow manages to magically fly around and attack you. I don't remember that in the movies. Once defeating her, you will get her infamous sweater. Some may argue and say this doesn't classify as an easter egg, but the truth is you don't need the sweater to beat the game. So to me, anyway, it just seemed like a nice, creepy bonus if you happen to stumble across it. Discovering this as a child for the first time was terrifying. Even looking at it now, it's horrifying. I mean, how many NES games do you know of that featured someone else's mother's severed head? Think about it. Think about that. That's a pretty valid question when you stop and think about it. Overall, the game is, sadly, just okay. It's definitely one of the better LJN games, but that's not really saying too much. I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people have made it out to be or maybe remember it being. It's just a difficult and cryptic game. There's a lot to complain about, but regardless, it still holds a special place in creepy gaming history. Since we're having a double feature horror show for Halloween, join me in part two when we will be discussing 2017's Friday the 13th from Gun Media and Ilphonics. I think that's going to do it for me today, folks. I want to thank you all so much for watching. Hi, I'm Mullet Mike with the <laughs> you pedal in full screen saying. Dicky, stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace.
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike, playing the role of Jason this evening. If you didn't join us last time, be sure to check it out. We talked about not only the 1985 Friday the 13th game, but also the 1989 LJN game that most people remember. But today... Today's gonna be fun, kids. Today, we will be talking about the new Friday the 13th game released by Ilphonics and Gun Media. We've got a lot to dig into, so let's just chop our way through it, shall we, folks? Turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey. Happy Friday the 13th, Happy Halloween, Happy October, Happy Happy folks. Thanks for joining me for part two of my Friday the 13th Halloween double feature. Let's just jump right in and get to the good stuff. Back in 2016, a crowdfunded project started up. That project was a new Friday the 13th game. Expectations were surpassed, and the project began development. The game was released digitally in May 2017. The physical copy is released on, well, October, Friday the 13th. What better time? This title was originally released as an online-only multiplayer, but more content has since been added on with more on the way. I love it when developers do this. It's like a game that just keeps on giving. Co-creators of the game, Gun Media, released a Camp Crystal Lake content map on their Twitter, but I'll get into this later. I just wanted to touch on it briefly to show the amount of content planned. But let's briefly talk about the game before we dig into Easter eggs and theories. The basic core gameplay is 1v7 online, more commonly known as an asymmetrical multiplayer. This game always gets compared to Dead by Daylight, and understandably so, but that may be another story for another day. Most of the time, you play as one of the camp counselors trying to flee, but occasionally you get to play as the man behind the mask himself, Jason Voorhees. Other than maybe Mortal Kombat X, I don't know if we've ever really had the opportunity to play as Jason, especially in this, his natural setting. As of the making of this, the game currently takes place at the locations from the first four films. I'm just gonna say spoiler alert right now for anyone who hasn't seen the movies. I'll be referencing them throughout the rest of the episode. Go watch them! Friday the 13th the game can be both fun and and terrifying at the same time. The attention to detail is amazing. I dare you to go play the first four maps and then go watch the first four movies, and I guarantee you'll see what I'm talking about. It's really kinda surreal. Being a horror fan, I've seen these films dozens of times, so it's cool to feel like you're actually at the Pakenak Lodge from part two, or the barnyard in Higgins Haven from part three. You know, without the fear of being killed by a machete-wielding madman. This game is riddled with Easter eggs, but like I just mentioned, most tend to be little nods to the films more than anything. Don't get me wrong though, there are plenty of creepy Easter eggs as well. Let me throw one out there before we go any further. I'm sure most of you know about this one if you've played the game enough, but I won't lie, it creeped me out when I first discovered it. Every time you begin a match, you'll see the counselors hanging out, usually around a campfire. Well, one unlucky individual never quite makes it to the party before Jason appears. Throughout the match, as you gather your items, you're liable to discover the unlucky counselor's body. As if Jason just stuffed him away somewhere. From what I gather, the body spawns randomly. 
I should note, your character doesn't react to the body like they would to another counselor's body. So you could be in a room for like 30 seconds looking for first aid or whatever before even noticing the rotting corpse in the corner. Either way, it's a creepy little easter egg and what I consider to be a very nice touch. When first playing the game, I really didn't know what to expect. I wanted to play it by myself first, without any friends. I just wanted to experience the game in its purest form. I wanted to be like a clueless counselor, so I muted everyone. I turned the lights down and the volume up, just to show that I practice what I preach. It was fun figuring out all the things that you could do, whether it be fixing a car to escape, repairing a phone line to call the police, or even just barricading yourself in a lodge. Either way, while jogging from cabin to cabin, gathering supplies, I saw this figure. At first, I thought it was just another counselor, but words cannot express the feeling I got in the pit of my stomach when I slowly realized that the figure was really Jason Voorhees. That genuine feeling of fear was more impactful than any scary movie I'd seen recently. The feeling of panic while running from Jason is a real adrenaline rush and contributes to both the fun and the terror that this game provides. To me though, the game really shines when you get the opportunity to play as Mr. Voorhees himself. After my initial experience, I gathered up my friends and we have been playing religiously ever since. Anytime you get a group of people together in a multiplayer experience, comedy is sure to ensue. This game, much like the movies it's based on, is brutal. If you haven't played this title, then you might see it as pretty cut and dry. But there's really a lot more to it than one may think. Throughout the game, there are tons of easter eggs, cryptic messages, and plenty of theories surrounding them. I guess the first that should be addressed is the Pamela tapes. They were supposed to be recorded by the police as they questioned Pamela right around Jason's drowning. The tapes can be hard to find, but discovering them all reveals a secret backstory to the Voorhees family. Since the tapes are so rare, I'll play for you some of the creepiest moments and biggest revelations. Again, spoilers. In the second tape, it is revealed that Pamela was actually a cook at Camp Crystal Lake, which explains how she witnessed the promiscuous counselors and Jason's actual drowning. It might have been addressed elsewhere, but I've always wondered about that. It is also in tapes 2 and 3 that Pamela reveals that she could hear Jason call out to her for help. Almost as if the two used telepathy. Which wouldn't be too far-fetched considering part 7. This is also where we first hear Pamela do the creepy Jason talk. Let's listen in. You don't understand. I heard him. I heard my Jason calling for me from the lake. He was calling for his, his mother. Mommy, help, mommy, help me, mommy. <laughs> if you've read any of the comics, then you probably know about Elias Voorhees. In tapes six and seven, we hear a truly disturbing revelation. You said Jason was your only child, that's correct? Jason is my only son. And his father, uh... Deceased since 19... I don't know. I don't know where he is. You mean where he's buried, ma'am? No. I don't know where Jason's father is. I haven't seen him since he... Let me see that. Mrs. Voorhees, this statement says you are widowed, that your husband is dead. My husband was killed, but he was not Jason's father. So you were married before, ma'am? No. This... Man did not marry me. We met. It doesn't matter where we met. He held me down by my throat. He forced himself. So we find out that Jason's real father was not 
Elias, but rather someone else. The question now is who? In tape 18, Pamela talks more about Jason's real father, and I just can't help but get this paranormal vibe from it. About Jason's father? I don't know his name. He never said a word to me that night. He just did what he wanted to me, and then left me there, bleeding. And after all these years, you've not seen him again. I would never, ever want to see him again. Ever! Then Jason never knew his real father. I married Elias because he was strong. I thought he would protect us. Protect you? Yes. From him. I could feel he was out there. Watching us. That being said, who or what do you think is the real father of Jason Voorhees? As of the making of this Halloween special, the developers from Gun Media have released this cryptic image showing eight dots, one of which is a light blue. Another image was released on the game's official Twitter account. Some gamers have theorized that this could be a tease for Roy, better known as Fake Jason from Part 5. Fakesen. Fakesen Voorhees. The reason people believe this is because of the light blue color. If you're familiar with the films, then you know that Roy's mask featured light blue stripes, whereas all the other movies with the real Jason featured the iconic mask with red chevrons. Another theory out there is that the single dot could be an indication of the upcoming single player content. Another theory suggests that it has something to do with the virtual cabin. Either way, it's pretty obvious that the developers are having some fun leaving us players guessing. Speaking of the Virtual Cabin, Ilphonic and Gun Media have announced Virtual Cabin 2.0. This tech demo of sorts was a great way to see what type of atmosphere the game was going to bring, and the first person perspective just made it that much creepier. The original virtual cabin was littered with easter eggs, but most of them, like I had said earlier, were just references and ties to the original films. It really showcased the attention to detail this title was going to present. There was one creepy easter egg I found, however. Toward the end of the demo, you'll see this cryptic board hanging on the wall to your left before entering the Jason room. This board features these weird runes and can be seen throughout the final game, but in the virtual cabin, certain glyphs are glowing red in a V-shape. I don't know, maybe for Voorhees? Either way, when activating the runes, the door to the Jason room will slam shut and you will hear the evil laughter of Pamela Voorhees. <laughs> <laughs> this game is scary enough when it's just some slasher running around, but throw in the ghost of paranormal Pamela and it just adds to the creepy factor. I can only hope Virtual Cabin 2.0 features some more new creepy easter eggs like this one. Overall, Friday the 13th has been both fun and scary classic creepy gaming content. Multiplayer with your friends makes plenty of opportunities for laughs, and playing by yourself can just be outright terrifying. Sure, the game has been riddled with bugs since its release, but since the community and developers have continued support on the game, I know kinks will be worked out over time. I still continue to play, and considering we're only about halfway through the Camp Crystal Lake content map, I look forward to see what's next for Camp Blood. Uber Jason, Uber Jason, Uber Jason! <sighs> well, there we go, folks. That was not one, not two, but three Friday the 13th games. <sighs> Overall, Friday the 13th is a great film series. Really revigorated slasher films as a whole, as a genre, if you will. I'm not saying it's the first, but it was one that 
really made it a household name. Hockey mask. And not even a modern day hockey mask. We're talking about like an old school hockey mask. They're still some of the most iconic symbols in horror today. Good on you, Jason. Good on you. Ow! I hope you all have had a great October. I hope you've all had a great Friday the 13th. And I wish you all a very happy Halloween, folks. I think that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I am Mullet Mike with <laughs> paddle and full screen saying, Kick the stay creepy. Thanks for watching. Peace. Just the right hat. I can... You you want me to do the episode like this? I don't. I mean, I'll try. I don't think it's gonna work though. I mean, we can we can we can try. I, I, I guess. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. <laughs> no, no. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, freaks and geeks, trolls and derps alike, welcome. Welcome all. I am Mullet Mike with us. Paddle Gaming Network and full screen, bringing you Creepy Gaming. As we continue the season of useless gimmicks, today we will be discussing Zelda Breath of the Wild. Look like a moron right now. I've repeated myself to nauseam at this point. Nintendo always puts creepy stuff in their games. It's just kind of turned into a staple now, a trademark, if you will, a pillar of what makes Nintendo games so entertaining, even for adults. Legend of Zelda has always had some creepy stuff, whether it's going back to the original games, the creepypastas based on them. There were tons of creepy aspects in Ocarina of Time, as well as the one we've covered probably the most, Majora's Mask. All that being said, why would Breath of the Wild be any different? Also want to mention real quick, in case you didn't know, we have our own Patreon set up. It will be linked in the description below. If you feel like contributing to the cause for applause, then be sure to check out our Patreon account. Become a patron today. All right, without a lot to get in the way of today's episode, we're just going to hop right in it. Ladies and gentlemen, turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. <laughs> The Legend of Zelda series has always featured a few dark aspects. I don't have to go into great detail, but most gamers have experienced at least one of the many legends. Do I really need to tell you what makes these games so great? They speak for themselves. Today, we will be discussing some scary locations, disturbing occurrences, and creepy easter eggs in the series most recent installment. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Real quick, this game went back to basics. The main complaint of recent Zelda titles is that they were way too formulaic. You gain access to a new area, you find a dungeon, fight a boss, and obtain an item to access a new area, rinse, wash, repeat. Breath of the Wild throws all of that out the window. Much like the original, you can now venture virtually anywhere. Past Zelda games have always had their share of creepy moments, ranging from the Dark World and Link to the Past, to the Ghost Ship and Wind Waker, to the Redeads from Ocarina of Time, to Dark Link, who first appeared in Zelda 2 and has pretty much stuck around ever since. You have the eeriness from Majora's Mask with the Termina Theory, pretty much all of Twilight Princess, including that one cutscene. Actually, I might have to talk about that later. Anyway. You get my point. It's Zelda. It's a Nintendo game. Of course they have inappropriately creepy content. Which is awesome. This brings me to Breath of the Wild. The game was released in 2017 for the Wii U and Nintendo Switch. This title was way more open world than previous installments. This title has the largest map of any Zelda game to date. So that just means more room for scary locations and easter eggs. Let's start with the Blood Moon. 
Much like that oh-so-familiar face that we know and hate from Majora's Mask, this game uses the moon to creep us out in a whole new way. This title uses an in-game clock to pass day and night quickly. Every few nights at the stroke of midnight, you will eventually see this cutscene. The blood moon rises once again. What is it about the moon in these games? Blood moon, blood moon, blood moon, blood moon. Nope, nothing about the blood moon. Did they try to make it as disturbing as possible? At least this moon didn't have that creepy face like the one from Majora's Mask. The blood moon resurrects any fallen enemies, and they remember what you did to them. It basically resets the game's items and creatures. Other than the reset, though, I wonder why Nintendo chose to portray it this way. This title features several references to previous games of the past, but let's focus on the creepier ones. I'm going to hot shot these first few, and then we'll go more in depth later. Dark Link, a character who has appeared in several of the previous titles, returns in this game as a special armor set. If you go visit the aptly named Kilton, you can purchase the Dark Link or Shadow Link armor. But more on Dark Link later. For now, let's discuss Kilton. This guy loves his monsters probably more than you do, and he's not afraid to tell you that. If you want the armor set or monster mask, this is the guy for you. His masks actually help you get past enemies, much like Majora's Mask, which, yes, makes its return in this installment. The first DLC expansion opens up a quest for you to find and wear Majora's Mask. Other scary locations include the Lost Woods, Skull Lake, various mysterious ruins, the Demon Possessed Shrine, and basically everywhere else in this game. It's hard to express the tension one feels when you go into uncharted territory. In a game of this size, with this much in it, you never know what's over the next horizon. The Sheikah and their strangely out-of-place technology play a big part in this Zelda title. Here's a creepy fun fact. One of the game's original concepts was actually pitched as the Legend of Zelda Invasion, which featured aliens invading Hyrule, if you can believe that. Remnants still remain in the final product, like the Guardians or your Sheikah Slate technology, for example. I mean, come on, you're basically in medieval times with a tablet. You can take selfies! Being such a strange concept, I found this to be noteworthy. And you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, this finally explains whatever this thing was from Ocarina of Time. Seriously! What was that? While not making it into the final product, this game still alludes to this advanced technology being around for thousands of years. Since we are on the subject of the Sheikah, let's discuss the cult-like Yiga clan and the random encounter that you may face. The Yiga clan are a broken-off sect of the Sheikah. They see things from a different perspective. Besides their surface-level disturbing appearances, it gets worse. While wandering throughout the land of Hyrule, you'll cross fellow travelers. Engaging in a conversation often opens up a side quest, or at least it's someone to buy and sell goods to. One stranger will even ask if you've heard of the Yiga clan. Regardless of your answer, he or she will reveal themselves to be part of the Yiga and then surprise attack you. That's because the Yiga clan is hell-bent on destroying Link. This is a great example of how this installment continues to surprise you. Just when you think you're finally starting to figure out the game, BAM! Yiga death cult trying to kill you. Story of my life, am I right? Oh, how do I get myself into this shit? The Great Fairy Fountain returns in this Zelda title. Several fountains, actually. One will even revive a fallen horse for you if needed. 
That's because this isn't a fairy, but rather a god. <laughs> Wait, what happened? May I present Frau Blucher? This, my friends, is Melania the Horse God. Why this is in a Nintendo game, I have no idea. I get it, Melania can revive your horse. But couldn't it just been another fairy? Why this bizarre being? Here's another creepy fun fact. We all know the stables can be recognized by the giant man-made horse heads on the roof. But... If you can get a bird's eye view, you can see the face of the horse god. Frau Blucher. Throughout my research, I decided to look up gods and goddesses with the name Melania. No luck, but ironically found out that the Celtic goddess of horses was named Epona. The Legend of Zelda and disturbing theories go hand in hand. I mean, there's Link is dead, Navi is dead, Epona is dead, Tingle is dead, Squall is dead, you get the point! One theory that was passed around for years was the Parallel Universe Theory. Going back to the adventures of Link, Zelda 2 is when we first met Dark Link, an evil doppelganger made of pure darkness. In Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, there was a mirrored shadow world. Hyrule from Ocarina of Time had its counterpart with Termina from Majora's Mask, respectively. The Legend of Zelda, A Link Between Worlds features a Hyrule and a low rule. The list goes on and on. This theory was finally confirmed by Nintendo when they released an official Zelda timeline. I won't begin to get into that because that would be like trying to teach physics in a minute. Wait a second. That's exactly what it is. It's metaphysics and quantum mechanics. Oh my god. Anyway, I digress. Many players have theorized which timeline Breath of the Wild takes place in. I'll reserve my opinion for another time, but you tell me which timeline you think Breath of the Wild takes place in. <laughs> Just from what I've gathered, it seems like most people probably feel that it takes place in what is known as the Fallen Hero Timeline. Interesting if so. I find it to be fitting. I will say this, the most disturbing aspect of this game to me wasn't the various easter eggs or theories, but rather Calamity Ganon. Evil won. Link failed and Hyrule lies in ruin. Everybody you once knew and loved from past Zelda titles, all dead. Most games in this series seem more optimistic. Think about it for a second. It's typically the story of the upcoming hero of time, that of legend and prophecy. In Breath of the Wild, you're a fallen hero fighting for his redemption. We always look too hard sometimes for a creepy hidden secret, when really, some of the most disturbing aspects are right before us. We just tend to overlook them. Between the Blood Moon, the Return of Shadow Link, the various scary locations, the Horse God, Majora's Mask, the alien-like technology, the Yiga Cult, Ganon, and the Calamity right before our very eyes, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild has done enough to go down forever into creepy gaming history. Oh, what are you looking at? Oh, hey, uh, that's going to do it for us today, I think. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I am Mullet Mike with a <laughs> pedal and full screen saying, Keep it steep, stay creepy. Thanks for watching, folks. Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Mullet Mike Hardcastle here with the <laughs> Pedal Gaming Network and Full Screen Arcade bringing you creepy gaming.
We continue this season of useless gimmicks with Five Nights at Freddy's 6 because, well, it's a gimmick in and of itself now. So turn the lights down and the volume up as we journey into some creepy gaming. Here recently, to no one's surprise, FNAF 6 was released, hidden under the name Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Simulator, but come on, it's, it's FNAF 6. I usually do a game review, but considering the ending of this game, I find all of that irrelevant right now. Chances are, if you're watching this, then you already know about FNAF 6, so let's just get straight to the ending because that's what's important. So if you haven't played Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, go get it on Steam. It's free. It's free right now. I will say this much. This is one of the creepier installments. Not because of any of the dumb jump scares, but rather the game's dark lore. This game, like the many before it, has multiple endings. But today I am going to play the good ending because I feel it reveals the most. There are two versions of this particular ending, one with a post credit sequence and one without. Let's play the clip and be sure to stick around after the credits and we'll discuss the ending further. You played right into our hands. Did you really think that this job just fell out of the sky for you? No. This was a gift for us. You gathered them all together in one place, just like he asked you to. All of those little souls in one place, just for us, a gift. Now we can do what we were created to do and be complete. I will make you proud, Daddy. Watch, listen, and be full. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth, if you still even remember that name. But I'm afraid you've been misinformed. You are not here to receive a gift, nor have you been called here by the individual you assume, although you have indeed been called. You have all been called here into a labyrinth of sounds and smells, misdirection, and misfortune. A labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. You don't even realize that you are trapped. Your lust for blood has driven you in endless circles, chasing the cries of children in some unseen chamber, always seeming so near, yet somehow out of reach. But you will never find them. None of you will. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. I am remaining as well. I am nearby. This place will not be remembered, and the memory of everything that started this can finally begin to fade away, as the agony of every tragedy should. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. My daughter, if you can hear me, I knew you would return as well. It's in your nature to protect the innocent. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms the way you lifted others into yours. And then, what became of you? I should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear. Not my daughter. I couldn't save you then. So let me save you now. It's time to rest for you and for those you have carried in your arms. This ends for all of us in communication. Congratulations on completing your work week. 
We apologize if your situation wasn't presented to you in a completely honest fashion when you first started, but it was important that your intentions and actions be genuine. Here at Fazbear Entertainment, we value fun, family, and food. But more importantly, we value our commitment to atoning for past mistakes and tying up loose ends. Thank you for your participation. There is no need for you to return to work next week as Fazbear Entertainment is no longer a corporate entity. Please accept this certificate of completion. Goodbye for now, and thank you for taking this journey with us. Many gamers and internet personalities believe this to be the end of the FNAF series, and I would find it to be fitting if so. One way or another, this ending revealed a lot. Throughout the game, we constantly hear this. Don't forget Saturday. You want them all to be in one place. Well, that's why. It was all an elaborate plan. In a strange way, watching the ending cutscene showing the previous games kind of made me feel nostalgic. It's weird. I don't know if I've ever played a video game series both funny and dark. After all, it features great humor. But it's still a game about dead children. Oh yeah. As forementioned, this title features several other ending cutscenes. I might post the other endings in a separate video, but this one seemed to be the most revealing, obviously. Think about it. Most, if not all, of the animatronics burned in the fire. It's over. This would be a nice way to wrap it all up. For now. I couldn't help but feel like the very first part of the monologue was directed at us, the gamers, the entertainers, the theorists, and the community overall. You have all been called here, into a labyrinth of sounds and smells, misdirection and misfortune. A labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. You don't even realize that you are trapped. Your lust for blood has driven you in endless circles chasing the cries of children in some unseen chamber, always seeming so near, yet somehow out of reach. But you will never find them. None of you will. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. Most importantly though, game creator Scott Cawthon thanks everyone for playing and supporting his FNAF franchise. That's why the game's probably free to play. And we say thank you in return, Scott. I know this game features so much more than just this ending, like the yellow guy, orange guy, golden guy, or whatever you want to call him. There's tons of hidden secrets in mini-games, there's BJ's bar, the graveyard at the end, or the eerie stories Candy Cadet tells you. 
there's still plenty of questions out there. I simply wanted to present a platform, show you the evidence, and let you, the creepy community, discuss further theories. For me, I'd be okay if this was the end, but I doubt it. I'd be okay not just because of the crazy amount of content and mind-numbing theories, but I feel like this would be a good place to wrap up my series on these games as well. Myself, along with many other internet personalities, have been around since the beginning covering back to the first Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> it seems so long ago. I would like to thank Chris Lott for providing this awesome music that has been used ever since our first FNAF video. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Nico Run of Deep Game Research. Follow him at Deep Game Res. He's helped me from the beginning as well. This is my way of saying thank you to everyone that has supported me during this series. It's been a good run of episodes, folks, but that is all for now. I hope you enjoyed. Hi, I'm Mullet Mike with the <laughs> pedal and full screen saying, <laughs> if you stay creepy, thanks for watching. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>